Hi, welcome to the Birds of a Feather uh, discussing user groups at KubeCon in Detroit. I'm Steve Wong. I'm an organizer of Kubernetes meetup groups in Los Angeles, and I also host another online Kubernetes-related uh, user group. I work for VMware. Um, the goal here is to brainstorm ideas on how we might come out of the pandemic with a strong support system that allows users to make friends, share experiences and best practices, while providing feedback to projects and vendors. Uh, this is a birds of a feather session, and I don't know, some of you might already be familiar with the concept, but these are a little different than a typical presentation session. Uh, I'll just go down a quick summary down the middle. The purpose here is to have a discussion, not to transfer knowledge. The expert here is by no means me, it's you, the audience. Uh, who asked the questions? Um, I'll propose a few to get discussion started, but, um, and we'll move on from there. The audience role here is to share opinions, experience, and feedback. So if you'd like, come, up, come on up for a more intimate setting and we'll be all talking to one another. Um, so I see my role as just facilitating discussion and keeping, on, keeping this on track. The Kubernetes community already supports user groups in some factor, and these are found on the Kubernetes community calendar. Um, most of these groups you see here, it's a busy calendar, most of them are actually very much dev focused along SIG boundaries, working group boundaries. Theoretically, they, users are perfectly welcome to join in, but if you were to join in, you'd find they're often very deep dives on specific uh, internal details of the Kubernetes project. Um, if you're an experienced user, you might be able to figure out where you go through the Conway's law of how these are set up, but um, there's just a handful of them that are divided up as either a user, labeled user group or a topic that is focused on a particular use case of Kubernetes. Uh, the, the CNCF also has some use case aligned groups like the IoT Edge uh, working group that recently moved over from the Kubernetes um, uh, upper organization. And there is a telecom user group I'm aware of. I think there's one or two more. Uh, the CNCF has the portal for end, labeled end user community. Uh, I went and looked at that just this morning and it sort of is geared towards companies that would become sponsors of the CNCF uh, with annual participation programs. And you can learn more about it there. Um, it didn't really have direct links to actual operating user groups if you felt you wanted to join one. And the reasons I think people join these are not so much to listen to presentations like you find at KubeCon, but also in the sense of local physical meetup groups. It's a place where people engage and make friends, maybe even look for jobs with one another or advertise postings in their local community. Um, so that's what it's about. Um, I don't know, I'll just skip through this. This is another slide I found on the CNCF portal. Um, Kubernetes meetup groups. Pre-COVID, these were very healthy. In Los Angeles, where I come from, the attendance at the monthly Kubernetes meetup group actually reached 250 people, was deemed unmanageably large, and we forked into two groups, east and west side, and each of the two eventually was drawing up to 200 people per month. Um, they died completely during COVID. We haven't had one since. Uh, I've been trying to bring one back, but had difficulty recruiting a sponsor to supply a venue. Um, in LA, they used to be held occasionally at Disney, for example, or at AT&T's DirecTV division, uh, which had a big studio space with a lot of capacity. Uh, I am aware of some user groups that actually thrived through COVID. The one in Atlanta, the one in London, actually grew membership uh, throughout the pandemic. And in fact, I joined those groups myself because somehow they got an interesting pipeline of speakers. But I think we'd like to bring back uh, the formerly thriving physical meetup groups that existed in cities around the world. So um, 
we want to move on now to the um, questions. And the first one will be, how can we foster and improve local physical meetings where users have an, uh, a great learning and sharing experience? So I'm going to come down off the stage and let's just together, get together and share some ideas. How about if we just do quick introductions since there's so few of us. I, I already went, but uh, Josh. Okay. Yeah, I'm Josh Burkus, uh, Kubernetes contributor, work for Red Hat. Um, I started and theoretically still run the Portland, Oregon Kubernetes user group. Um, and, and what I mean theoretically is we've been on hiatus since the start of COVID. Um, what, what, well, Maybe we should postpone it, but I... Sure. I'm Zach. I, uh, I work at VMware building Kubernetes platforms. Um, I actually haven't participated with Kubernetes user groups, but I was uh, part of an organization in college that was, I'll summarize it as, a, as like a Linux-style user group, and I really enjoyed that and haven't quite found the, the same thing since then and, and so was interested in this Where topic. Based I'm based in San Diego. And so my name is Alexis. I um, work as a developer advocate for Elastic. Um, before that, I was a DevOps engineer. And um, I would say that my introduction into Kubernetes was when I was in DevOps. Um, but since being a developer advocate, I joined a Kubernetes user group in Dallas, Texas. And um, we haven't met a lot this year, but I'm hoping that that changes. Hi, my name is Rin. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm from Oakland, California, where I work for Honeycomb, which is um, observability tooling. Um, I run the Open Telemetry Meetup Group right now, which is a fully virtual meetup group, but um, just came off organizing um, are essentially second community day type gathering for the open telemetry community, which was a very big lift. So experience doing an in-person thing now, interest in conversations with developer advocates from all over about possibly doing local meetups, but how do we do that? What does that look like? Really interested in learning from y'all's path in the Kubernetes community since y'all are at a little bit later stage and hearing what people are doing. Um, also, I was one of the founders of Women Who Code on a sort of more personal level. I'm just wondering with uh, your attempts to resurrect the Portland group that uh, what did it look like before? What changed and what are the troubles you're having? And do you have any ideas for how you might explore getting it back to where it was. Okay, yeah, well, I'm going to have a question to pass over, right, because the, um, so what happened was um, it was a fairly strong in-person meetup group with 30 to 70 attendees, depending on the meeting. Um, but, you know, we rotationally hosted by various businesses in the Portland, in downtown Portland area. And, um, even though now we probably have enough members who would be willing to do an in-person meetup, um, which wasn't true really until recently, um, no one will host it. So then I would be facing trying to actually rent a venue for hosting, which really ups the budget on a, of a per meetup basis. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, and we did actually for a while do online stuff um, at the beginning in 2020, but audiences kind of fell away quickly um, I did talk to some places that have had much more successful online meetups, um, like the folks over in Amsterdam, for example. Yeah. But the amount of effort they put in their online meetups was way more than I could actually have time for. Um, the, um, so one of the things I was interested in is what things have you found to actually have engagement and interactivity in an online meetup? 
I can talk a little about this. I think we are still working out our quirks. Um, we've only been meeting once a month for a few months now. So one thing I try to do is I program these very specifically to have one person doing hands-on coding and one person doing who it, who has already implemented open telemetry in the particular language. So each meetup is people who are interested in a particular language. So right now we're mostly focused on Kubernetes and .NET because that's where I've had people come out and say, hey, we're implementing open telemetry. And it's almost like those two meetup tracks are a separate community within the meetup. Um, so I think being very specialized helps. I think not offering formal talks, like like I said, it's live coding with space for people to interject or to um, say, hey, actually, I don't understand this. Can you back up? As well as sort of a higher level, more functional discussion that captures people. What I would like to work on is having sort of a mandatory discussion segment where, like this, where people pass the mic around and discuss and we haven't quite gotten there yet. We're still, you know, getting there with the rhythm of the programming and with expectations. And also people won't stay for more than an hour on an online meetup. So we already have a lot of programming for an hour. Um, do either of you run online meetups? So, um, so I haven't run any online meetups yet. So I've been in my position about three, four months. Um, I've done in-person meetups. Um, what I found out from my team was before, during the pandemic, we were focusing on online, but as soon as we made that transition, we didn't necessarily do a good job about, you know, having that hybrid model. And so we weren't really getting a good turnout when it came to in-person. Um, and what I've realized is that our pipeline that we have for meetups is, you know, getting that, that speaker that everybody is going to, you know, be interested in and sort of, you know, uh, having a rinse and repeat cycle, but I haven't really heard that, hey, let's do a live coding. And I think that, yeah, I think that's something that I'll consider for, for the future meetups. Yeah, and I've been running an online uh, user group. It's um, somewhat odd because Kubernetes, a few years ago when they split the cloud provider plugins out of tree, uh, put in place a provision where each cloud provider could try to charter a user group. And they thought that every cloud provider, Amazon, Google, would compose one and run one. And as it turned out, only the one I run, which is running Kubernetes on vSphere, got chartered and went into operation. Um, it was okay pre-pandemic. You know, I think at the peak, maybe we had a meeting with 45 people showing up. But interestingly enough, during the pandemic, attendance actually dropped. And I... And I talked to people, and I think it was just this phenomenon called Zoom burnout, where yeah. people were spending eight hours of their workday on Zoom with their colleagues, depending on where you work. And the last thing they want is one more Zoom meeting. It just felt painful rather than, you know, something that duplicated that experience of uh, close discussions. And an interesting aspect of that is that this same group that has been operating on Zoom, we we held a physical meeting at KubeCon in Europe, and obviously not all the membership is even in Europe, but more people showed up to that physically at just an informal meeting we had in a restaurant than we'd been getting at the Zoom meeting. So I think there, a signal to me was that there might be people who are missing close interaction with people coming out of this so that these might be even challenging times with Zooms because of that carryover Zoom burnout phenomena. Right, I'm experiencing both those things as well. Um, lots of people showed up to the meeting here at KubeCon, people we never met, never were involved in the open telemetry community. Um, and, um, you know, we're having, besides the meetups, we're having open an open discussion time in, like, we'll have the meet with the program meetup on the first week and the open discussion on the third week. And very few people are showing up to open discussion. I feel like people maybe to be convinced to attend one more Zoom event, they needed to have a strong agenda and a strong, I could be wrong about that, and I'm really interested. It sounds like you're experiencing the same, so. 
Yeah, I mean, my experience with in-person meetups is that if I didn't have a primary topic for the meetup, um, that turnout would be non-existent. The, um, um, so one of the, like I said, one of the, the other problems, the other reason why I think we lost the online meetup audience, at least in Portland, was, you know, both for Kubernetes and for the DevOps meetup, where there's a lot of crossover between the two particular meetups, um, the, um, one of the main reasons for people attending was for uh, hiring, right? Is either people were looking for jobs or people were looking to hire other people. It was a big part. Like every meetup, we would start out with hiring announcements. And that didn't really port to the online format. Like I actually tried to get employers to participate in that, and it just really did not work. And I think without, I think that was a really important part of the in-person experience. Um, I totally agree on that hiring. I totally agree on that hiring aspect because in LA, more times than not, the host of the venue was in a position where they were trying to hire. So they put up ta recruiting tables uh, at that event. They weren't necessarily an IT vendor at all. They just wanted to use the meetup as an opportunity to do hiring. And there's some of that where, you know, maybe the tech industry is at a downturn and I can see where maybe those companies that would sponsor something physically wouldn't get the same value out of online because they'd see they'd already had an online recruiting presence anyway. Um, I'll throw out a few things because I talked to people, I was trying to recruit people to this session downstairs and some of them gave me some ideas but we're unable to be here. So Lisa Namphy at Cockroach Labs told me that she had successfully put on an online meetup recently in San Francisco and managed, it, it, was, uh, uh, it was only because she got some company willing to take on the COVID related obligations. You know, in California where I live, mm -hmm. you have to register people, check vax cards, and even ha potentially have a mechanism of tracking reporting afterward. And a lot of company legal departments will nix it currently. I'm hoping that goes away, but that's a big part, I think, of reluctance on the part of volunteers to host venues. But she said that once she got it, the attendance was just excellent and the particip participation was excellent. Um, I also heard from somebody uh, who had a return to physical meeting in Amsterdam and they weren't sure what to expect, declared it, and 450 people showed up. And wow. it was so big that they couldn't possibly fit them and they just took over every bar and restaurant within a four block vicinity. Mm. But people just kind of missed that social interaction. So maybe we can, uh, aspire to sort of the world coming back if we just wait it out. Um, let me go back. I was gonna say, even with us like waiting to like, and hoping that the world will return to normal and that people would get that comfortability again, how do we measure success now? You know, like, I think that's one of the things that I sort of think about because it's already a little, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's already a little shaky to try and measure that success. But then, you know, yeah, how, 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 would, we, how would we get to that point even now? I had three questions. I don't even know if we'll get to them all. But the next one was going to be how we divide up because this is really about user groups. And... We've got user groups like the meetup ones are typically just generic Kubernetes, an awfully broad topic. Yet some of these Zoom ones that are operating tend to be more focused on use case niches such as machine learning or I actually have a Zoom on IoT Edge. Uh, I know there are some on telecom, on financial, on retail, and a few of us here represent particular projects or products and I'm wondering if what people's thoughts are on the best way to do these, both, you know, maybe it would be best the physicals were wide open because you could recruit speakers on a broad swath of topics. Maybe if you're going to continue to have Zoom, 
more de niche things are better online because you collect from worldwide audience, but I'm open for thoughts. Well, so this actually goes into, uh, I'm going to actually address two questions at once because she asked this question about measuring success. Mm -hmm. And so one of my difficulties with a lot of stuff like the online meetups and that sort of thing is that part of my goal in creating a meetup is to actually create a community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is um, yeah, to actually create a community of people who, you know, regularly dial into the meetup or regularly attend the physical meetup, you know, um, uh, you know, welcome newcomers, have some of their, you know, stuff that they own, that they do, interact with each other, you know, in some social fashion, et cetera. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why a lot of these pursuing, you know, sort of worldwide meetups, you know, basically topical meetups, right? So you pick a topic and you're not particularly geographically attached. Hasn't been that appealing because I haven't seen a way to sort of build that kind of community identity. Um, I know people are trying. Um, for example, we had here at this KubeCon the, the data on Kubernetes community. Um, and I know that they're trying, but I also know that they're also finding it really hard. Yeah, yeah we have tried to build up a Slack channel around the meetups and it's, it's hard, like we have to do a lot of cultivating of that channel and like trying like, oh yeah, here's a question for this week, trying to bring you together, like a lot of basic grooming. And I don't know, honestly, in the end, how strong the urge for all of those folks to connect is. Um, I think that is why we're trying to narrow the use case for the online ones. For the offline ones, to be perfectly honest, I know that before the pandemic, there were cloud native meetups in particular cities. And I would really love to team up with a group that is doing a cloud native meetup in a few large cities, preferably ones where we already have the presence of a developer advocate or a company that's really involved in open telemetry and say, hey, we'd like to provide quarterly meetups for you on this topic or whatever, and not try to run my own meetup exclusively on open telemetry because I just think it's still too small of a topic. I think that's a really interesting model, I, because I feel like you know, I'm based in San Diego, and I don't know that I would go to an open telemetry meetup weekly or even monthly in San Diego, but I, I might show up to something quarterly, and in the other 12 weeks of the quarter, if there were other kind of niche topics, I, I wouldn't show up every week, but I would pick and choose the ones that were interesting to me. Um, and instead of having that balance of broad, like uh, over the, the span of the community, it's kind of broad, but on any given week, you bring together people to talk about a specific topic. I, I think that helps with sort of what Josh was saying about community. Like you see sort of the same people coming and it may not be the same people every single week, but you get different subsets of the people each week to have like a focused conversation about something. And, you know, it, 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 for me, that's more interesting than just kind of like general, like, oh, let's get together and talk about cloud native. Like, I, I, it, it, it's, that's too vague to get excited. Yeah. Anyone who wants to talk about cloud native generally is probably selling something. Mm. Yeah, one thing this, this was Lisa's idea, too. She dropped this Easter egg on me when she couldn't be here, but she said to make sure to remind people running local meetup groups that there's a big payoff in cross-promoting. If you're in a big area that is running meetups on specialized topics as well as general, nobody ever turns down, in her experience or mine, the opportunity to send out the meeting notice to their mailing list. Uh, and it's just like your situation where you might subscribe to only one meetup group, but not even be aware there's two or three others. And the cross promotion is sort of a win-win for any group organizer and uh, brings the broader geo community together more often.
Now, I guess we'll have to uh, delegate this out, but my third question that I put on, and I'm open to any other people putting questions on the table, was how, what should we ask the CNCF to do to support uh, these groups operating now, or maybe even prospective groups? Yeah, so I, I don't have an example of this from the, say, technology community, but for another community I'm involved in, um, you know, there's like a local meetup group in San Diego and, you know, in a typical event we get, I don't know, five to ten people from that community. And it's a, a topic of sort of broader interest. And so one of the uh, sort of key notable people in the, the broader community did a, I'll call it like a mini roadshow where they said they'll attend the, the meetup in this city on this week and the meetup in this other city on another week and, you know, planned a, you know, like a couple month long trip around. And we saw, I mean, somewhere between 50 and 100 people show up just because this author was in town and we all came out. And in the, the couple of weeks following that, we saw much higher attendance and it sort of trailed off, but we ended up sort of higher than we were before at a, a steady state. And so about a year later, the same thing happened. And, and again, it sort of like helps to kind of reinvigorate the community. And so getting back to this topic, having CNCF or specific projects help to, to bring n notable people that everybody wants to hear from to some of these larger, you know, geographic areas and sort of have a, uh, a special guest at a meetup to, to sort of give an in-person talk about a, a book they wrote or a podcast they run or some sort of community they're involved in. I, I think that could get people excited and, and out who might not show up uh, otherwise and, and have them meet people in the community and, and want to come back next time. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this has been tricky. I feel like we do have a lot of support within our project because we are the only meetup group happening for the project. Um, and I'm working on it with two or three people. So while it can be stressful, like no sense of burnout. At the same time, we don't, and this is a project-wide problem and not a problem specific to open telemetry meetups. We don't understand what resources are there from the CNCF and how to access them. And my efforts to try to reach out have gone completely nowhere, either through service desk or through going into different Slack channels for meetup organizers and saying, hey, is anyone interested in teaming up? We've got this great virtual meetup and content available. And I see some of you are having virtual meetups, but I don't know how to connect with those people. And I've even tried sending them individual messages on meetup.com and stuff. And it's just all crickets. And it would be great if there was someone at the CNCF who could actually connect us with some of these groups and some of these resources like this site that they supposedly have for meetup organizers. OK, I'll talk to you a bit afterward, but I'll throw out the name Taylor and give you his link. Obviously, something isn't working as as well as it could, but it isn't that there's total crickets there. Yeah, I mean, this doesn't have anything with cross-pollination. Currently, statutorily, the support that the CNCF have is the Bevy platform. And that's the, the only current official support for meetups. Um, there was some money, but that was really focused on in-person meetups, and they haven't figured out, you know, um, how that relates to other kinds. The um, So, uh, but that has nothing to do with doing cross-pollination, right? That's people. Um, and I think part of the reason why you're getting crickets, actually, is that so many of the meetup organizers currently are still, you know, my in-person meetup is still on hiatus, so... Josh, I hate to put you on the spot, but I'll do it anyway, so maybe I don't hate it so much, but I know that you're one of the organizers of the SCALE conference, and it got aligned with, uh, you know, some sort of Kubernetes, what do they call it, community days or something. Uh, it isn't a meetup per se, but it is a physical conference. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about what's involved that? 
Well, so one of the things is with the, is they have the whole KCD program, which is smaller regional conferences um, that are getting put on. And for regionally based meetups, it, it makes sense to link that up. But we're having the weird thing right now, right, is obviously the LA meetup has been on hiatus for, for however long. Um, and so um, also one of the other problems that we had with the CNCF that the meetups went through is COVID hit right when we were moving off of meetup.com and onto Bevy. Um, uh, because meetup.com had been bought by um, the workspace company right. and, right. and had always honestly been mismanaged, but the mismanagement had gotten much worse. Um, the, um, so um, the, um, but a lot of these KCDs are going forward. And they may be, for a lot of the regional meetups, a really good way to actually revive those, right? So like when we have KCDLA, part of it should be talking about, hey, so for those of you who are local, let's talk about the meetup. Um, the, um, and, and that could work for regional meetups. It could also work for topical meetups um, because there are topical events, right? Like, for example, we had a bunch of colos here. How much promotion of topical meetups was there at any of those colos? Just got a couple of minutes left if anybody has some final thoughts or even questions. Um, when it comes to virtual, uh, like the virtual meetup groups that you all have been having, has it been, ha have you only been targeting sort of like the United States or have you been targeting outside of the United States and ha has your approach changed based on what region or sort of like what country that you're like looking into to pull for audience? Yeah, um, I can answer this. We're still relatively small. We have been targeting doing the um, main live meetup in a time convenient for most U.S. and EU people. It falls at 6 o'clock EU, 10 a.m. Pacific, um, you know, 1 p.m. East Coast, that whole time zone. Um, we are currently working with meetup hosts in with hosts in Europe and Australia who are hosting the unfacilitate the the like unprogrammed conversations. So there's three of those, which is one reason our attendance is low, frankly, because we're splitting the audience across three. And the hope is to get the programmed meetups online for with those hosts, so they so people can rewatch the programming, but not. And it's just, we don't have enough organizers to have programmed meetups in three different time zones. So that's how we're approaching it at the moment. Um, in the past, when I've worked at Mozilla and some other places, I have had to deal with sort of figuring out how to work cross-culturally. For example, there, the Indian community is really like a lot of contributors to Mozilla live in India. And so it's been a process of like enabling people differently based on where they're based and doing a lot of listening. And ideally, you have an employee of your company who is aware of the culture and can help you with some connections and introductions. That'd be my strongest advice is get somebody engaged who understands that culture and can make some introductions for you. So I have been running uh, online Zoom meetups that straddle really the, I think the membership is very much geo-distributed. I can tell you more things not to do than things to do. Um, one of these groups we tried having multiple times, we only tried two, not three like, that you alluded to, but it turned out to be somewhat of a problem because people couldn't remember, we declared that Every two weeks we'd flip and we had one that was geared towards North America, one for Asia, China, and polar opposite times really. But people ended up showing up on the Zoom. If you own the Zoom group ownership credentials, you'd see these things like three people joined the Zoom and they're at the wrong time zone one. And I always thought it was perfectly well marked, but it becomes an issue trying to do the logistics then speakers see that you have two slots. Sometimes the speaker would show up at the wrong time. Um, or the speakers, w when they saw two were available, you had time, a tough time getting fills in the off one. 
in retrospect, we ended up killing one and going back to a single occurrence at always at the same time. But even that, the lingering people who had it in their calendar lasted for over a year. And shifting your meeting time around, in my experience, is problematic, that people just want to get in that pattern. And they're likely, many of them are working at a place that have recurring meetings. So it dropped into that particular slot on the calendar for them. And they can defend that if they're interested in the topic. But if it moves around, it's much tougher to remember and join. And it's much tougher to not have conflicts come in in your workspace uh, if it varies from one cycle to the other. Now, theoretically, if you go look at the charter details that are in the Kubernetes project too, you are not supposed to unilaterally declare one as, say, the group chair or lead. You're supposed to put it out to a membership vote. Now, when you pick a new time, that's tough because maybe only the people who find the current time convenient are there to vote. So I've always put the voting out on the Slack channel where it's a little more asynchronous. Um, but, you know, actually having group membership pick the time and the day is probably a really good idea. Um, but it's going to be a compromise. So maybe you do that, you know, some of those online polls let you have rankings and things that maybe can allow you for a compromise of people who have a second, third, and first choice. Okay, I think we're at or past time anyway. So uh, thank everybody for coming. Um, I thought it was a good conversation even though we, we experienced the typical issue of late in the day slot on the last day. Yeah. And uh, thanks again. Yeah, thank you for your time. Yeah.